Hello there and welcome to Community Life. Here we talk with the community experts about their life journeys and learn from each other. And today we have a conversation with Christina Garnett, an award-winning advocacy strategist, a data nerd, a great adventurer, a thought leader with thousands of followers within social media, a community club mentor, and an art lover. So, hello, Christina. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm super happy to finally talk to you. And once you shared that life is better near the water, mm -hmm. why is it so? It's just calming. There's something about being around nature that is just... It just centers you, puts you in a better place. It really makes you prioritize what's important. And just being near water, I whether it's a lake, whether it's the ocean, it doesn't really matter. Um, it just always comes from a place of, of just peace. It's very peaceful. And still, lake, ocean, yeah. sea, what yep. do you like the most? Um, I like... I have to say, I have to say like, I like rivers or lakes more than oceans. Oceans, my only problem with the ocean is, is if they're overcrowded. I like the quiet. I went to Maine a couple years ago and, um, it was, it was not as, it was not as crowded as other beaches that I've been to. And I absolutely fell in love. Yeah. So more about the people, <laughs> how many people are there versus, um, versus not more water, less people. <laughs> yes. Yes. More nature, less people. Yeah. Perfect, perfect match. So let's start from the beginning. Tell me about your parents. Who are they? Um, so I have an interesting background. My mother was a teacher. My father was an engineer and did like QA analysis for um, companies that worked in, that created like um, equipment and things like that. So he was always like in the QA lab and making sure that things were up to par. Um, My dad is very much a nerd and raised me on all the things that a lot of the things that I love today. So he's raised on the Beatles, raised on Monty Python, raised on a lot of, he was, he's an Angliophile. So I was raised on a lot of British stuff, um, which I still obviously love today. Um, and then my mother was more about um, classic Hollywood. So like my love of Audrey Hepburn and I watched AMC and Turner classic movies before they kind of, um, especially AMC before AMC kind of resurged as this like breaking bad. And for those of you who are, <laughs> who are young and don't know this, like AMC used to be like mainly classic movies. It wasn't, um, it wasn't like Mad Men and, and breaking bad, like, and walking dead, like it's known for now. How, how did it go? So you were having family evenings and watching mm -hmm. those movies. So how it was for you, how did you learn it? Um, I tend to observe things. Um, I'm, I, a lot of people are confused when they meet me the first time or taken aback the first time they meet me in person, because on Twitter, especially I'm very opinionated and I have a lot of things to say. And then they see me in a, like, they'll go and see me at a conference and they're like, you're really quiet. And I was like, <laughs> the person that's on Twitter is the person that only like my, like my inner circle sees. because they've kind of like, they've, they've earned that access. And so when they find people finally meet me in person, I'm, I'm, I'm very much an introvert. I'm that person that's always observing, looking around the room, seeing what's happening. Um, and I definitely, I definitely had that as a child. Um, I'm just, I'm always observant, picking up things, whether I do it on purpose or not. I just unintentionally sometimes just pick up things. I pick up behavior cues. Um, can't really help myself. And Does it mean that you are more observant than than acting, and or you are observing and then like making a good action? So, how what what is the connection in, in between observation and action for you? Yeah, um, I think it comes down to is it my place to do anything, or is there something that requires action? Um, I think I think when we look at the work that we do. Um, you have to be very observant. You have to be noticing social cues and change slight, even slight changes in behavior. Someone's like no longer engaging and maybe something happened in work or in their public or in their private life um, versus certain people are grouping together. I think it, I think the difference between observation and action is 
like, is there a reason for your action? Is there something that you can do to either improve the situation or expand the situation by the observations that you're making? And I think really good marketers um, are also very good observers. I think pattern recognition is probably one of the most underutilized skill for marketers and professionals in our space, because you have to be able to acknowledge and see those patterns before most people do, and then understand how, if you're correct, how could that play out long-term and what can you do to either push it along if it's the desired behavior or to um, prevent it if it's not the desired behavior. So um, it really depends on, is there a need for your action on top of that? I, I, I don't think that every observation requires an action on top of that. Sometimes it's just an observation and it, it can continue on without, without impediment. So you are more into big data. So you need like more repetitive things or you also pay attention to some small data, something that happens once, but like totally like unusual. No, I definitely look at both. I definitely look at both. I think, um, like with the SVB stuff that's happened this past weekend, that's in black swan events. Um, obviously we're looking at that from like a, from like a singular event, but then we're also seeing people who are talking about it in the grander scheme of things. Is this like a replay of 2008? Um, and the thing is, is that especially with the work that we do and the work that I do at HubSpot and the work that a lot of us do in the tech space is even though it doesn't directly relate to the work we do, if it impacts our community, it impacts us. So we need to be paying attention and we need to be thinking about, well, what are the implications of it going in this direction versus that direction? How is it going to impact our customers? How is it going to impact our partners? How is it going to impact their everyday lives? Are the, is it already doing that? Should I be social listening and looking for um, call outs of that? Are they telling their story? Are they trying to get feedback from others? What does that look like? Um, you have to look at both. You have to look at both. If you if you're only looking at one versus the other, you're really doing a disservice because you're not really able to see the full picture and you might be giving too much credence to something that's small or isolated, or you might be giving too much impact or too little impact to something that clearly has markers for a domino effect, but you, you chose not to see it because you weren't looking at it from that wider lens. You know, you have such an amazing background behind you. Yes. How did you come up with this idea? Um, so I was working um, working from home before before COVID and everything. So I already had this space. This is like an extension off the house, and it was our dining room. But like most families in this modern time, we don't we don't use it. <laughs> it's just not it. So when it was very clear, like we were never going to use it as a dining room, um, and I knew this was going to be my back wall. I was like, I love music. Music is so much a part of me. It's the one thing that like no matter what I go through, I always cling to it. It's my first love. So I was like, I, I love art. I love music. So um, I collect vinyls. Um, this isn't my whole list, but this is like my favorites. Um, so put them out there. I'm a massive Foo Fighters fan. I love George Harrison, the Beatles, um, this Radiohead. Um, so there's, I have different things that I absolutely adore and mean a lot to me. And then um, my husband's an illustrator and he went to Syracuse to get his master's in illustration. And he has all of these like, portfolios on portfolios of these pieces of art that he had made just like in sketch class like it took him five yeah. minutes or it took him 10 minutes and I was like can I have them like can I <laughs> pick which ones I want I want them in my in my office and he was like they're just sketches and I was like no they're really good I really like so can I can I pick and he was like sure go ahead just take whatever you want um so continuing on the music theme we have these two and then that's more of like a silhouette um, study of silhouette and so these are playing guitar and then um, we we like to go to galleries all the time I always joke if you don't know what to do with me just take me to an art gallery and like I'll just be the <laughs> happiest person in the world just like let me sit there and just be near beautiful things um, so we get to Asheville quite a bit to see um, to see different artists and go to the to the art area there which is absolutely fantastic and that is um, one a piece that we bought um, from one of the local artists in Asheville um, yeah, that's the that's the whole thing. Art, art, and music. I I adore both. Do you play the guitar? I do not. My husband does. Yeah. Oh. How how frequently do you have this family concerts? 
<laughs> not as much as I would like. Not as much as I would like. Um, my husband is when he's not playing video games at night, he's usually like tinkering and playing, um, playing different tunes on his guitar. So it's always it's always nice and calming at the end of the day to just have someone just like play guitar for you and just like hanging out. <laughs> it's nice. It's very nice. So Beatles is from your father and yes. fighters, where does they come from? That's me. That's me. There's a there's a saying that um, I forget where I saw it, but it talks about how like when you're 14 years old, that's like the seminal year for you to really kind of start figuring out like where your parents where your parents taste stops and where your taste starts. And literally when I was 14 years old, I was very much that I was like Hermione, but into grunge, like if Hermione went to rock concerts. <laughs> and so um, that's, they came out, the first Foo Fighters album was when I was 14. So um, yeah, I've loved them. I've loved them my more than half my life. Yeah. Was it a sign for you that their album came just when you started this disconnection, let's say from parents? Um. It wasn't really a sign. They definitely like between the Foo Fighters and and the Beatles. They're my favorite. Those are my two favorites. So um, I could really kind of let go of everything else and just like the deserted I the the desert island question. Like, where what would you bring? And I was like, I'd have Queen. I'd have the Beatles. And I have the Foo Fighters. And I don't need anything else. Like, I'm fine. I'll survive. We'll be good. Um, But then looking back, when I had heard that 14-year-old thing, I looked back and I was like, well, of course they did. <laughs> of course they did. So yeah, it's very much, yeah, they're my they're my favorite. And they're the go-to. And they have they have their aggressive stuff and they have their soft stuff and they have their acoustic, like their acoustic stuff is my absolute favorite. I'm I'm a massive fan of um if I hear like the first bars of a song and it's an acoustic guitar is the first thing I hear, and I was like, this is gonna be good. This is gonna be okay. <laughs> I'm a fan. Let's go. Got it. So let's move more closer to yourself. Uh, yeah. Tell me about your childhood. From what age do you remember yourself? Um, I think like my first memory is of my sister being born. Um, so I remember How that. How old I was, were you? I was almost four. Mm -hmm. um, and then I remember I did a lot of dance. Like I danced from like three to 13. So like dance recitals, like classic Southern girl hair, like spray painted with like hairspray to the point that it was a rock um and like a little bun um i did that i sang in choirs i um i wanted to be a writer or an actress when i was younger um mainly writer but always like thought about like the movies and shows and stuff like that um loved reading i spent my whole childhood just like hiding in books. I absolutely love to read. Um, I always like to travel, never really traveled as much as I'd liked as a child, which is why like as a parent, I, I want to take my kids to all sorts of places. I can't just take them to a beach every year. Like <laughs> let's do more things. Let's do different things. Um, let me see. Um, I remember like my father's side of the family, my grandparents, I was very close to them. They were my absolute favorite people on this planet. Um, yeah, lots of lots of music, lots of lots of books. Yeah. And now, being a parent, mm -hmm. do you take your kids like not only to the beach because you want them to see the world, or mm -hmm. because you feel like, okay, I'm a parent. I have to act correctly, so I have to show it, show it to them. <laughs> um, I try to, without without saying too much, um, in a lot of ways, my parents were a what not to do list. <laughs> so I really try to be conscious with my children about, like, instead of saying, like, I'm going to plan this entire trip. And we're going to go and you're going to have to force to go. And here's the agenda. And here's the, like, here's everything we're doing. And, oh, I didn't make, I didn't leave any room for you to do what you wanted to do too bad. Like every, I remember every trip as a child feeling like I was just there because there was no childcare instead of like, this is a family trip. And like, I was supposed <laughs> to enjoy it. Um, and I want the exact opposite re um, reaction for my kids. So if I'm planning a trip, I let them be a part of the planning process. I'll let them see like what it looks like, what it entails. 
um, what can, what can we do there? Like, what are you most excited about? I try to have them have some level of power in the situation. I don't want them to feel like, Oh, I gotta go. Cause mom wants to go here and she wants <laughs> to do this and she wants to do that. Like, and if there's things I want to do, I make sure that it's balanced so that there's things that they're going to see that they're going to be excited about. I'm very much in the vein of, um, don't buy things, make memories. That's very much where I'm at. So when I'm planning things, it's like, well, we're not just going to do the annual beach trip. It's what could we do? That's really cool. What's a once in a lifetime thing. Like, um, speaking of the art, um, my daughter loves art. She's always going to art camps. She's always drawing. She's always singing all these things. So we went to see, um, like the, the Van Gogh and they had like the, the immersive experience where it has like his art all over the walls. Like I made a point to go, like, we're going to go, we're going to see it. It's going to be beautiful. Like things like that, just trying to find things that are not just, um, the ordinary traditional trips. How can we do something that's like really cool? Something that they they've never seen before. Um, maybe they've learned about something in history class and we go and take them there and they get to see a little bit more, or maybe, um, there's a musical they want to see. I went and took my daughter to see Wicked um, a couple years ago because she was I I would play the the soundtrack for her and she was obsessed. And I was like, let's go, like let's let's go. That's something that, um, that's that's a great moment in time. So things like that. I'm just always trying to figure out what would I want to do, but also what would they want to do. And I feel like it's you do a disservice when it's all about um, regimenting these vacations where it's only what the parents want, but the parents kind of dilute themselves into thinking like, no, the kids will have fun. I was like, no, you're <laughs> yeah. dragging them all over kingdom come and they want to do one thing and you won't let them. <laughs> yeah. And talking about your kids, do you observe them and then decide what might be interesting for you? Or how do you, how do you make them excited about this planning process? How do you involve them into this planning planning process? Yeah. Um, so I do observe them, but um, they're a really interesting mix of my husband and myself. So they'll do things and they'll be like, oh, that's my husband coming out or oh, that's me coming out. Um, I try to be as very honest with them as possible. And I don't talk down to them. That was one thing that was very interesting. Um, we never did baby talk with our kids. Like we talked like I'm not going to use SAT words with them, but I'm going to just I'm going to talk to them the way that I would like if they were a small adult. And because of that, that's how they've grown up. So I remember they were like in kindergarten or first grade. And one of the teachers said that when they tried to talk to them the way that they would do other kids, like they, it wouldn't connect with them. I was like, talk to them the way that you would appear. <laughs> and as soon as I did it, like, oh, that totally worked. And I was like, don't talk down to them. Like, don't talk down to them. Like they'll, they're smart. Like just trust them. <laughs> um, and so because of that, I try to do the same thing. So if there's like, we have sports that they're playing And we're very clear, like, are there sports that you're interested in? Are there sports that you're not interested in? I was, I did like dancing for 10 years and I probably hated half of them. Why was I doing that? <laughs> I should have had a choice. I didn't have a choice. Um, and same thing. So like my daughter plays basketball and softball. She loves it. And if there's a day that she's like, yeah, I'm not going to play it next year. I'm like, okay, that's fine. <laughs> Good for you. Like you made a choice. Um, So I, I try to empower them and make them feel like they have some level of, of power in this situation. I obviously don't let them go nuts and like run the house, but I do let them be very clear about like, this is what it takes. And if we're going to do, if we're going to go on a trip, like we got to figure out a hotel and we got to figure out a car situation. If we're going to rent a car or if we're going to fly or like, what are we going to do? And so they see that it's, it makes them also not take the trip for granted because they realize that I didn't just like, click my fingers and all of a sudden everything materializes. Um, and then seeing like, all right, if we went here, would you like this? Would you want, would you want something that's closer to this location or would you rather have a bigger pool? Like really letting them being a part of the process, they get more excited about it. Like my daughter's always the one who packs like two, three days ahead in advance. She's so hyped. She starts planning in her head about what she wants to do in like the gaps that I didn't fill. Um, But that's because she knows what's coming. She she knows what to expect. She knows why she should be excited. She feels like she has some level of empowerment because she's part of the reason why we chose to go there. So it it gives them a sense of ownership of the vacation or the trip. And then um, I find that that fuels their excitement for it instead of it just being like, this is just what we do. We're just we're just going to go there. Yeah. 
how do you agree when you have like when your ch- child children have different views mm-hmm. for example somebody wants yeah. to do this thing and somebody wants to do next another thing yeah. how do you like agree on it um i really like having them talk through it and and showcase like why should we go to one place over another and if it's a place where if it's a situation where like both trips are fantastic then maybe we just do one first and then we do the next one next um but i i let them talk through it and really kind of have that conversation of why should we do this first versus this one or which one would be better for us and what is that what's the rationale for that i like them having the ability to have that um that option to do that learning and really kind of that problem solving element of well which of the two is better and why is it better and why why and sometimes they change their minds from hearing each other and like oh, okay and other times they like get even firmer in their opinion and like nope actually <laughs> <laughs> um and it just it it all goes down to that empowerment you know it sounds very similar to sound um to pitching startups for investors <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I created this elevator pitch and let's talk about it. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Let's go. And then we and then we decide as a family. Yeah. You tried the My Heritage AI time machine. Yeah. So mm-hmm. yeah. what was your favorite depiction? Um Honestly, like all the stuff that's not now. I find that I don't have I I don't I don't meet the beauty standard for this time period. I just don't. Like I just don't. I'm not an Instagram model. I just don't. Um but there's um there's a thing that it was like a TikTok I saw a few weeks ago that I I absolutely adored and my husband can attest to this. Um it was this woman and she was talking about how she was trying to hide like all the parts of her that are not deemed as beautiful. And it has like it's the ancestor trope where it's like someone from the past is looking at you and be like, "Girl, you would have been art." Like you would have been renaissance art and my husband who studied a lot of this stuff and he's like girl we would have we would have, we would have loved you in florence <laughs> like so it's that i i prefer like the older stuff i have a round face i have more classic features it's going to be the stuff that's just older um i find that i just and i've accepted it i'm not i'm like i'm fine with it but it's very much like I am not what you would call a beauty in modern day times and that's totally fine. I would much rather be art anyway. <laughs> Have you ever imagined yourself living in some past centuries? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um I've always romanticized it and then I get to the point where I realize that I would make someone mad because I would say something highly opinionated to the wrong guy and then like <laughs> Romantic like romantic idea over. <laughs> Then it would get bad. Yeah. And what century was it and who were you? Um I love I love the Renaissance. Um so probably go back there. Yeah. Why? Just the art. Nothing like it. Absolutely nothing like it. Um I keep I keep um I went to Florence in 2007 and I keep meaning to go back. I want to go back and just kind of sit in the Uffizi for hours and take my husband cuz like I said he hasn't he hasn't been but he's obsessed with um classic art. Um I love the idea of just being surrounded by so many beautiful things. Like just the art that came around during that time period is just second to none. So it would it would have to be the Renaissance. What do you like the most about art? I like that though there is a singular image and it clearly is what it depicts you have the artist intent and then you have the viewer intent and they don't have to be the same it doesn't have to be and you can have pieces that resonate with you you can have pieces that mean significantly more to you um you're in a position to to really to really kind of jump into art and see it in an emotional way that it may not necessarily have been intended to and that's okay. Like that's absolutely okay. Um I find that being able to 
to sit in front of these things. There's, it's very similar to like the water thing. Like it's very peaceful and calming. There's something so calming to me about just being in a museum and walking around and there's this quiet and there's this stillness and there's just this like gentle, silent appreciation of beautiful things as everyone just kind of walks through and absorbs all these things that they're seeing. Absolutely nothing like it. It's one of my favorite things. You know, I heard that in some universities, there is a teacher of art and mm -hmm. she tells her students that they have to spend three hours watching at a painting to understand, like to find the mm -hmm. most details and to really understand this painting. So how much time do you usually spend watching some art? One, not one as, object. Not as much as I would like. Not as much as I would like. Um, I do have a print of, um, I'm going to mess up. I'm going to mess up the name of it. Um, but it's a print by Renoir. Not not the real one. Um, but it's this little girl with a little bucket with a little pail. Um, and I have one of those in my bedroom. So I'm always, I wanted something beautiful. I was like, I'm never going to be a billionaire. I'm never going to have like... A, like an actual piece in my in my house but I have that and I I look at that daily it's just so beautiful and um the real one is in the National Gallery in DC so um I'm already planning on going this summer to see it and to spend some time around Monet's um I but I don't get as much time as I would like I took an I took an art class in college um modern art and sculpture and um didn't get nearly as much time to, to absorb as I wanted to and wind up not going into into um, becoming an art major because there was so much about like memorization and what was the year it was made and who did it and like what period and like um, which is fine and you should know that information but um, my favorite was the classes when we would actually like deconstruct and like what it was like within this like greater scope of what was happening in the world at that time period and things like that. So um, short answer is not as much as I would like. <laughs> Do you notice some new details every time you see this picture? Yes. Um, she has, um, her face changes to me, depending on the light, depending on um, what mood I'm in. Sometimes she's very solemn, sometimes she's like quietly happy. Um, yeah. So you like books, you wanted to be a writer, you like art. Do you write about art? I don't write about art. I probably should, but I don't. No, a lot of my, a lot of my fiction is about um, like everyday people dealing with, dealing with things that they, um, that they're struggling with. Like I wrote a piece about a girl who was going through depression um, And I have other pieces that are more about um, like how regular people are handling technology or things like that. It's usually a singular person and their challenges versus something that's significantly greater than them. So water, museums, <laughs> quiet things. What about yeah. fire? Um, fire's good. Um, I'm a fire sign. <laughs> I'm a Sagittarius. Um, fire's good. I I find that um, I like a good bonfire. I like a good. Um, we've been to a couple places where they'll have like s'mores for the kids, so it's always nice to to have them have a place where they can roast marshmallows and stuff like that. It's very um, very serene. Yeah. But what's for more? Okay, so. <laughs> water more yes <laughs> what about history do you like history i like history i don't like all history i definitely have like my own sort of um particular um thing i was obsessed with like like what i think for whatever reason like i think most girls are like i was obsessed with the romanovs when i was younger and like russian history during that time period like found it fascinating um I love anything in like Dickensian England. Um, yeah, I, I, I love certain pockets of history is probably the best way to describe it. Yeah, love the Renaissance and everything that was happening around that time period. Um, I, um, 
I love the Assassin's Creed video games and how you're able to like essentially it feels like you're walking through history in certain in certain pockets of history. So um, definitely love those. What about science? I don't have a brain for science. I was good in biology. I took AP biology in high school. I did bio in college, did chemistry, wasn't very good at chemistry. Um, I'm fascinated by science from like a science fiction perspective. Like I've read a lot of Isaac Asimov and um, I find it fascinating. Like I, I love NASA. I, I'm one of those people that's more of an appreciator than a doer. I could never, like, I absolutely adore NASA. could never work at NASA because I'm not smart enough. Like, the janitor at NASA is smarter than me. <laughs> like, can't do it. <laughs> so, but I, I do love science, but I'm not a doer of science. It's not in my wheelhouse at all. <laughs> What did you feel when watching SpaceX's Falcon 9 launch? It was amazing. It was exhilarating. Um, we had, um, it had been postponed. So it was literally going to be the day after or the, or two days after the 50th anniversary mm -hmm. of the landing on the moon, which is obviously big enough in its own. Um, then it got pushed back, I think like a week or two after that. And then we get there and I brought my family because I wanted them to experience it too, even if they didn't get to be as close as I was. And I was like, you're like, how many people can say they got to see it? Like, unless you live in Florida, how many people can see yeah. that they got to watch a rocket launch? Like, let's go. <laughs> um, so we went and the day that it was originally set to launch, um, there was like a cloud cluster. And so the conditions were not correct. And they wound up waiting to the very last second, hoping they would be able to do it. And um, literally with like three seconds left, they're like, nope, they scrubbed, they scrubbed the launch. So I was like, okay. <laughs> so then the next day we're going again, we're trying. Meanwhile, people have booked their flights. Half the people left. Mm. So, because they, they had literally had a flight the very next day. So they, and there's no guarantee. Because there's so many conditions that even NASA can't control. Yeah. Um, so we go and it's going to be like an afternoon launch. And so we decided to take the kids to Disney Springs. And I was like, we're just going to go. We'll have lunch in Disney Springs. We'll see all the little booths. You get like a tiny little taste of Disney while we're here. Um, and it was like sprinkling the whole day. And I was like, oh, this doesn't feel good. Like, this isn't, like, I don't think it's going to go. And then, so my husband was like, well, we could just stay. Like, if you don't think they're going to launch, like, we could just stay. And I was like, you know what? If I choose to stay, it's going to go up and I'm going to miss it. And I'm going to regret it for the rest of my life. Like, I just got to go and wish for the best. I got to go. I have to, I have to try. So they dropped me off at where they're going to take us. We go to this little like area that only like NASA people can go to. Um, it's like significantly closer than like the access to every that everyone else has to see the launch. Um, we're all waiting there. None of us think it's gonna hit. And then like five, I can't, I cannot explain it. Like five minutes before the set launch time, all of us, and I mean all of us, just have this wave come over us, and it's like. I think it's going to happen. Hmm. I think it might go up. And you can tell like we're all like with every passing second, we're getting more anxious. We're getting more giddy. Our hands are shaking. We're trying to make sure that like our gear is set up for like pictures and video and like all these things. <laughs> um, and it gets closer and it gets closer and it gets closer. And, we're, and we can hear them like doing all the checks and like, basically waiting and be like, we're just going to wait and see if this happens, see if this happens. And the, we're just like, the tension is building and building and building. Five seconds left. It becomes so clear. Like this isn't getting scrubbed. It's going to go up. Um, it was magical. It was absolutely magical. Yeah. If you, if I highly recommend if anyone has the ability to, if you see a NASA social and you get to apply to attend and you get to go and you get to go behind the scenes at NASA. You get to go to like where the press corps goes for like NASA stuff. You get to go to the museum. You get to go like you get to, there's like a subway on base. You eat at the subway. Like <laughs> you, like you get to go inside these buildings. You get to do a lap of like all the different points. So we saw like the SpaceX and it had like 
Teslas all in the parking lot, not surprisingly. <laughs> um, but it was it was absolutely amazing. I recommend anyone to apply. It was one of the best experiences of my life. And the NASA team, like we worked with the NASA social team. I cannot say enough glowing things about them. They they must have been exhausted. They must have still been tired from the 50th anniversary stuff. But they were lovely and they were funny and they were kind. Like just one of the best social teams I've ever been lucky enough to to work with. Um, absolutely love them. Nothing but glorious things to say about NASA. Sounds like they really love what they are doing. They do. You can you can really see it. You can see it in everything that they do. They they definitely love what they do. They're very passionate, brilliant people. So yeah, absolutely. And also, it sounds like you were very lucky in, in this story. Yeah, so, very lucky. Yeah. In general, are you a lucky person? Um, I don't I don't know if I'd say I'm lucky. Um, I'm very clumsy. So if I am lucky, I feel like the clumsy like balances it out. So then I'm just normal. Um, yeah, I, I would say I'm blessed. I have a lot in my life that I'm happy about. Um, my kids are happy and healthy. My husband's happy and healthy. Um, I work for a company I, I love. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I feel very blessed. Yeah, I totally understand you. And a few days ago, you wrote... If I ever put a USB correctly on the first try, <laughs> I'm buying a lottery ticket. I am. <laughs> Have you ever won something in a lottery? Um, I don't think so. Like I've won like contests, but I've not won like a lottery or anything. I don't really play the lottery, so. But have you ever played the lottery? I think I've done like a scratch card or something or something when it was like $3 billion, dollars, when it was like more money than God. And you're just like, yeah, that's fine. Here's $2. We'll see what happens. Oh, yeah, yeah, just, ah, okay, try next time. Eh, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> What's the difference for you between a lazy Sunday and an active Sunday? Um, a lazy Sunday is when there's no plans. You kind of let things go as they go. And so it might be like brunch or it might be just staying in bed or it might be going on a walk or going to the, like a local lake or something like that. Active Sunday, I think of like, we have set things to do, set times to be there, errands, church, things like that. So am, am I correct that lazy Sunday is when you have nothing planned? Yes. And otherwise me. it's an active Sunday? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Got when you just kind of like take it as it comes. Like I love, I love a Sunday where, or even a Saturday when we're just, we do stuff, but we don't have any set plans. And like, we'll go, like, we'll, we'll take the kids and we'll do brunch and like, we could be there for an hour. We could be there for three hours, just talking to each other. It doesn't matter. Um, just kind of taking it easy. Have you ever had this, like, let's just get out of home and find out what we will do. Um, I'm more likely to do that on vacation than I am at home. Because mm -hmm. at home, I, I kind of know like all roads lead to certain places. <laughs> so it's not really, it's not really an option. Um, on vacation, usually we'll do that if we don't have anything planned. And to say like, here's the main, here's the main thoroughfare. Here's the main street. Like, let's go down and see like what we want to do. That's what we did in Savannah. Um, we went in Savannah last year during our week of rest and there's like a main, there's like the main road that goes by the river. And so one of the days I was like, let's just walk and see, we can find a restaurant. Um, one of the Marriott's has like a dinosaur exhibit inside the lobby. So there's like an actual like massive dinosaur reconstructed. And you have like all of these um, like amethysts and gemstones and, and fossils there. So that was one of the things that we did. We're just like, that's where we're headed. And whatever we do on the way there, We'll see. Maybe we'll get swag. Maybe we'll get gifts. Maybe we'll go stop and have candy, like whatever it looks like, but we'll go on our way. Yeah. What was the best thing you found during such walkings? Um, I really love taking pictures of nature, as you probably saw from my Instagram. I, I'm for a digital marketer, you'd think I'd have selfies all over that thing, but I don't <laughs> like it's just trees. It's just trees and water. Um, 
I love taking pictures and I love my kids have under, they understand my aesthetic. So they'll pick out shots and be like, that looks like mommy's Instagram. Like that's, (laughs) she'd probably take a picture of that. Um, Yeah. It's those little moments that you're like, I'm going to capture this tiny little moment for, for posterity and let it just kind of live. Yeah. Just little things like that. It's all about the little things for me. Do you ever review them? Um, yeah, I review quite a few places. Um, I'm, I think I'm like level seven or level eight on like Google, Google guides. I just got a thing for like, you get this pen, Google maps pen. So, but I tend to only review when I'm happy. I don't like to review bomb. So a lot of my reviews are only if I love something, if I don't love something, I I tend not to review it, but if it's good, it's good. I'll review it. Yeah. I find that like, if it's something that's terribly bad, I'm either warning others, which is fine. It needs to be done. But chances are, if something's so bad, there's other people who've shared that negativity. I don't need to add to it. Like, the warnings are clearly there. But if it's positive, like, let's direct people towards the great stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, you're a great reviewer because, you know, usually I know that people are writing bad things. And if everything okay, they're usually, like, silent about it. Yeah. Once you shared that, uh, it was a question. How yeah. does a drive make everything better? So how does a drive make everything better? I live um, probably about 20 minutes from the Blue Ridge Parkway. And in the fall, when the foliage is, is like blooming and it's perfect, there's nothing like if I'm stressed, if I have a headache, if I... I very much feel grounded as soon as I get in nature. If I need like my blood pressure to lower, you got to get me in nature and I'll be fine. Like I'll, I'll kind of like come back to my like default settings. Um, And so in the fall, I love lazy Saturday, lazy Sunday, just taking, grabbing some food with the kids and us just driving down the parkway. And it's just calming and slow and beautiful and it does, it, it, it resets my factory settings. Also, you share that nature is the best escape. Mm-hmm. And is it better when you are on your own or with your family? It depends on what mood I'm in. I'm, as, as an introvert, I definitely need my alone time. Um, so sometimes I, I desperately need to do that and just be like, just me, just me. Um, but there's other times where it's like, no, this is nice. I'd, I'd love to share this with my family. So it's... It's, it's not, there isn't really a, a go-to answer. It, it really depends on my mood and what I need. I keep seeing your tattoo from time to time. So tell me it's history, yeah. it's story. This one? Yes. <laughs> um, it's Chaton, which means kitten in French. Hmm. Um, yeah. It's my husband's nickname for me. Um, we, when we were going to get married, um, we got married in Tybee Island, which is near Savannah. And I took him to Savannah because he'd only been for like, football trips when he was like on the road to see Virginia Tech play. So you've never spent like quality time in Savannah to really appreciate it. And it's one of my favorite cities. So we went and kind of showed him like, this is why we are getting married around here. Like, this is why I'm doing all this. Um, And we were going to get tattoos in Savannah, which we did. Mm -hmm. Um, And we were going to get our um, wedding date in Roman numerals on our wrist. And I was like, great. Um, and then they told us that it wouldn't be, um, as small as we wanted to, it would bleed Mm. and it wouldn't be visible. So we would need to do the numbers itself instead of the Roman numerals. Well, my wedding anniversary is October 4th and I live in the South. And so I'm not going to have 10, four, which is like a trucker, like, okay, 10, four, I'm not going to have that on me. So I was like, absolutely not. We will figure something else out. Absolutely not. So he got my nickname for him on his wrist and I have his nickname for me on my wrist. I I feel like <laughs> it's even better than just I think it's better. I think it's better you know? too. Yeah. How many times a day do you check Twitter? Oh I never leave. It's always <laughs> <Okay>. up. <laughs> even even right now you're messaging something. I have yes, a like computer reposting. here. <laughs> <laughs> I have a computer here. I have a computer here. <laughs> Um, and I do a lot of social listening, so I always keep Twitter up. So there's always like an open Twitter tab. So the whole like, I'm going to open it up and see it. I'm like, no, it's always there. It's always open. I never leave. 
<laughs> Why? Why is it so? Um, I absolutely like now. Granted, it's changed a lot, and not for the best. Um, I I love. I love Twitter in the sense that like kind of what I said earlier, the person I am on Twitter is the person that a lot of people get to meet or get to see when they've known me for years. Mm -hmm. They, when they've bypassed all the walls of security that I have around me, <laughs> um, the emotional walls of security. <laughs> um, I, I love so many great people. Twitter has introduced me to people who like will be lifelong friends. Some of them are family to me now. Um, and so it feels like Twitter is that tether to the part of the world that I love. And, and then I can just mute and block everything else. But I, I love Twitter. Some of, my, some of my best friends were introduced to me from Twitter. So it's um, whether it goes down like the sinking ship it is or it stays afloat somehow, like it still has a very close, um, has a very special place in my heart for the people that it's introduced to me. I'm I am eternally indebted to Twitter for the, the opportunities it's given me, the jobs I've gotten because of it, the connections I have, the friends I've made along the way. Um, yeah, it's um, it's very close to me. It's Nothing's going to ever replace Twitter for me, if I'm honest. So what is the path to becoming your friend? Like, first, you see <laughs> just, some tweets. Just say hi. What just is going hi. next? Okay, but you told about walls, about security. Yes, stuff. walls and security. What is yeah. the path? How it works? <laughs> How to become your friend? Um, I think it just comes down into, um, like just engaging with each other on Twitter. Like if you say something that I see that I think is like really smart or hilarious, that's probably the easiest way to get on my good side is to be funny. Hmm. I love funny people. I collect funny people. They are my favorites. <laughs> um, but like, don't take yourself serious, too seriously, have fun, abashedly, um, say what matters to you and what doesn't matter to you. And, um, but talk to other people. I thought the people that I struggle with the most on Twitter are the people who their entire Twitter feed is them just reacting to people loving on them and who are kissing the ring and they only retweet themselves. I'm like, Oh my gosh, this, it's not this serious. I promise you, like, it's not this serious. <laughs> it's, it's just a couple, it's just a couple like pieces of copy hmm. on a, on a little, on a little app, like, no one's solving anything. Like, just calm down. Like, let's just <laughs> let's be funny. Let's laugh, and then just looking for people who have um, commonalities. I tweet a lot less about marketing than I used to because it just felt like a drag. Mm. And it's hard to it's hard to talk about marketing when the world's burning down. So it's like I'm just gonna dive right into my escapism. So I talk a lot about Marvel. I talk about a lot of shows that I'm watching and music that I like because that's escapism. That's my happy button. And so when other people have a similar happy button, I'm, I'm significantly more likely to be like, let's chat, let's talk. Let's like, that's cool. I'm so glad that you're, that you like it too. Um, it's this like micro community based on escapism that I, that I really love. Talking about Marvel, what is your mm -hmm. favorite Marvel movie? Hmm. Um, the one that I think is the best is Marvel slash Sony. Um, because of right issues, um, but it's um, Spider-Man into the into the Spider Verse. It's easily the best Marvel made movie. Period. Wow. Not even close. It has it's done something that a lot of the other Marvel movies are struggling to do, which is to have, especially now, which is to have this balance between serious drama and comedy. I feel like Love and Thunder was a really good example of what happens when you get that tone wrong. Um, but it also really brings the comic book page to life in these just like really beautiful ways. The soundtrack is stunning. Absolutely love the soundtrack. Um, and there's so many moments that are just so clearly done from a perspective of a fan. There's a scene, it's pretty famous, where Miles Morales is, um, he's jumped off the building and it, it looks like he's in free fall, but it looks like he's floating because it mm -hmm. like slows down time and you, and you see like the cityscape behind him and it is just absolutely stunning. It's my, it's one of my favorite scenes. So it's gotta be Spider-Man into Spider-Verse. Like it's, it's hard to beat that one for me. Now I have one more amazing movie to watch. Yes. You oh, much. you're going to love it. Oh, you're <laughs> going to love it. It's so good. It's so good.
It's so well done. And they nail so many different characters. They get characters right that they have no business getting right. Things that should that should not work, work. Yeah, it's that one. Seems like you also know the story behind its shooting, not just the movie. I absorb everything I can. If there's something I like, I go like deep dive. So I'll watch YouTube videos. I'll read interviews with like the directors, like all these things. So I tend to, yeah, I tend to over index on things I really like. Talking about football, soccer. Mm -hmm. Why yes. Liverpool? I love Liverpool. <laughs> um, I've loved them since Rafa and Gerard. I've loved them since before they got they got um, cop and they they've been doing all these like amazing things and winning all these championships. Um, I there is something about the fan base and Anfield and um, just really seeing. There, there's such a love of the game and love of the area. I absolutely adored um, when COVID hit and people weren't able to go to the games and they invited people to send their Liverpool merch, like merch and like blankets and scarves and stuff. Mm -hmm. And they decorated and like they decorated all the seats with all the things so that the people were technically there in spirit. Yeah. It's just little things like that. But like, I really love like just mean a lot to me. And I love how passionate everyone on the team is and how they genuinely love each other and want people to do well. And Mo is talented, like so crazy talented. And I love that he's, he's getting the flowers he deserves. He's, he's such a great player. Um, yeah. I, I love Liverpool and I, I love that you'll never walk alone. It always makes me emotional. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm a Liverpool girl. And even though I told it, I won't say it was worth community. It <laughs> still feels like community. It know? feels like community. Yeah. It really does. Yeah. I, I absolutely love it. Yeah. And I believe that if you have a good team and if you build this connection with your fans, yeah, then it's more than just sports. Yes. Yeah, it is. You know, Christina, I really wish to have the sky as a limit to our conversation, but <laughs> time is the limit. Yeah. So let's jump to the rapid fire questions. Let's go. So ducks or gators? Ducks. Basketball or football? Football. What are your favorite color and song? Favorite color is cobalt blue. Favorite song is George Harrison's While My Guitar Gently Weeps. Have you heard this? Um, um, okay, I will, I will ask you this question later. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> If you were a superhero, what superpower would you have? The ability to read minds. Who do you learn from in the community world? Name just one person. Rosie Sherry. She is an icon. Name two people whose community life journey you are happy to hear about. Basically, who should I reach out and have this conversation with? Erica Moss, who's on the HubSpot community team. She is amazing. And Jenny Swirda, also on the HubSpot community team. Both of them are absolute queens. I love them to pieces and they're brilliant. They're absolutely brilliant. And they do a lot of really great work at HubSpot. Got it. And is there one question that I definitely should have asked you, but didn't? I think you're good. I think you did a great job. <laughs> you're not making it easier. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, Christina, you know, like... I love conversations when we meet with person first time mm -hmm. for the first time, because like when when I, when I like had conversations before, it's a little easier because you always know like this person, you saw their emotions, you know what their voice sounds like and all the stuff. Mm -hmm. But also, I love very much when I'm kind of preparing for the conversation, and yeah. then I see. Wow, oh, it's a really great person. I would love to talk to them. And then like you I have this conversation and yes, it's a really great person and <laughs> very funny and shiny and interesting. So thank you so much for being you. It was an amazing conversation. I enjoyed it so much. I did too. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor.
So see you in the community world. See ya. <laughs> and thank you so much for listening. If you like the show, hit the like button or five stars and share it with your friends. That's it. We're done. See you in the next episode.